Well, after spending the last five weeks during uh, the Lenten season in the desert, we today are going to retreat from the desert to celebrate the beginning of, of Holy Week with Palm Sunday. Many of you know that today is Palm Sunday. Uh, but as many of you know, we have one more trip back into the desert uh, to go, and that, ca- that comes, of course, this Friday as we gather together in this place, uh, in this space, to, to remember Jesus and his journey to the cross. And as I said, I hope you can join us for that. Well, for today's break, I asked you, who is this a picture of? Now, I had some conversation with some of you, and some of you said it's Clark Kent, right? Some of you said Christopher Reeve, uh, who's the actor that played this person. Uh, Some of you said, well, it depends on who you're looking for. Who are you looking for? Some of you said Superman, and you would all be right, of course. Uh, but I know, and I, and I know that there are like uh, modern versions of Superman. I was saying to somebody else, I know there's been some new movies. I haven't seen any of them. Honestly, I couldn't tell you who the actor is who played the character in that most recent iteration. But for me, when I think of Superman, it's got to be Christopher Reeve uh, playing the part. I just loved those movies as a kid. And they had really creative titles, Superman, Superman Roman numeral two, and Superman Roman numeral three. <laughs> Very creative. But you know, there was one thing that always bothered me, and I guess maybe not just about Superman, but maybe Batman as well. As the audience, we all know that Clark Kent, who is pictured here, was really Superman, right? We all know that. Because maybe we see him jump into a phone booth and do a little twirly thing, and he transforms into Superman. But I don't know if it's just me, maybe it is, but did you ever think that his disguise wasn't super convincing, <laughs> right? I mean, didn't you want to sometimes scream at the screen and say, just look behind the glasses, it's Superman, come on, Lois. You know, Lois Lane, you're talking about how great Superman is, and here you're talking to Clark Kent, just look, it's Superman, can't you see it? Here's a side-by-side, obviously the glasses, as I've mentioned, uh, he's in a suit, Clark Kent is in a suit, and Superman's in the super-duper Super duper costume there. And also, I don't know, this is what you know, the internet's great for uh, leaving it up to like really nerdy people to decide that to tell you what is different between the two. Clark Kent has his hair parted to one side, but Superman's hair is parted the other side. Plus, you got that little curl that probably took some stylist an hour to cement on his face with hairspray. But I digress. Some of you are saying, are we in church today? Where are you going with this? Well, here's where I'm going with this. Superman moved among the people of the city as Clark Kent, right? As a seemingly ordinary individual, uh, but his true identity was concealed behind a pair of glasses and a mild-mannered demeanor. But, and here's the thing, but when the moment called, he revealed his true nature a hero of extraordinary abilities dedicated to serve the good of humanity. Uh, humanity. And today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on a humble donkey, the crowds laid their palm branches and cloaks before him. This day was not just a moment of celebration, of course it was, but it was the revealing or the unveiling of his true identity. Just like Superman, Jesus had moved among his people. He taught them. He healed them. He showed compassion. But on Palm Sunday, the hidden was made visible. And the Messiah was no longer just a teacher or a healer. He was the promised one, the king who had, came, had, who had come in the name of the Lord. And so this morning, as we dive into the significance of this day, I want you to ponder this question. How do you and I, how do we respond to the revelation of Jesus' true identity? How do we welcome him into the Jerusalem that is our hearts? 
Now, over the years, I've tried a couple different ways, uh, many different ways to tell the same story, right? This is the challenge of the preacher, uh, especially a couple times a, way, a year, Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, uh, Christmas. Uh, it's, it's the same story. It doesn't change. Uh, and so I'm always coming before God and saying, God, what do you want me to say this year? What, what is a little different? What, what have I not seen in this narrative uh, that, that you want to show me? And so as I was studying this year... Uh, something really struck me this time around, and that was the healing that Jesus performed right before Palm Sunday, which, we've, which you can find in your Bibles in Mark chapter 10. I'm not going to put it up there on the screen for you, but it's where Jesus heals and gives sight to a man who was blind by the name of Bartimaeus. Now, what is significant about that? Well, I think, let me preface it by saying that in all four of the Gospels, pretty much every time Jesus performs a miracle, performs a healing, uh, uh, turns water into wine, all of these things, casts out demons, all of the, in all of the four Gospels, when he does something like that, he tells the person that he heals or he tells the people that have witnessed this, don't tell anyone about this. Why? When the disciples ask him, why, Master, do you not want people to know? And what he says is, it is not the time. The time has not come. The time has not come. But now, on that first Palm Sunday, it was time. And isn't it appropriate that the last healing that Jesus performs before this very public revelation of his identity is to give a blind man sight? That hit me right between the eyes this week. And in a sense, on Palm Sunday, on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus was giving everyone eyes to see who he truly was because the appropriate time had come for him to be known as the chosen one, as the one that was set apart as the Savior. That everyone would know that Jesus was the Holy One that was prophesied about, that he was the promised Messiah. Now, the Palm Sunday account is one of the rare events that shows up uh, in all four of the Gospels. And I was tempted actually today, and I, I know I've stumbled on this before, there's, there's somebody online who, who blended all of the Gospel accounts together so that you get everything that happens. Not every Gospel writer includes every detail, but I thought that might be a little bit too out there. So I'm going to read straight from the scripture, but I'm going to take from the other gospel accounts because some things, some, some of the gospel writers mention branches. Some of them say John is actually the only one that mentions palms being laid down. Uh, and so there are different details with all of, uh, all of the accounts. But today we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 and, and we're going to read um, uh, Luke's account. And there's a specific reason for that that I'll uh, tell you a little bit later. Starting in verse 28, Luke 19 Verse 28, going up to Jerusalem, as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a cult tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead and found it just as, as he had told them, as they were untying it, the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And so uh, he gave it to them. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And I should just stop for a second and say, in John's account, uh, right around this part of the narrative, it says the disciples didn't realize what was going on until much later. Isn't it helpful to know that the, 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 the people who spent three years with Jesus didn't understand exactly what was going on until later. That encourages me, but all right, I digress. Verse 36, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, this is a moment that Jesus is recognized as king, as I've already stated. This is his coronation. Everybody know what a coronation is? There was a coronation just last year where Prince Charles was recognized now as King Charles. I'm still getting used to that. I'm not a big royal, uh, British royal person, uh, but, but I know that it hadn't happened in 70 years. And so for those that follow the British royals, it was a really big deal. Months and months of planning went into the coronation. And it was a big deal. Well, uh, but here for Jesus, this coronation seems impromptu. But Jesus knew it was coming. And don't be mistaken, this plan had been in place for a very long time. In fact, the very scene was, uh, that we just read about was prophesied about in the Hebrew Bible in the book of Zechariah chapter 9. Let me read it for you. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion, Israel. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. I mean, this was a young donkey. Now, real quick, why a donkey? Why not a mighty horse? Why didn't Jesus say to his two disciples, go to one of those Roman soldiers and take the horse with, the, you know, like the armor on it and the red robes or whatever. And, 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 and the same thing would happen. You know, why are you taking this horse to the Lord? Needs? Okay, right. I mean, he could have done that, but why... A donkey and not a mighty horse. Well, simply put, Jesus is the humble king. Amen. Jesus is the humble king. This is the gospel that we lay down our lives, not just our, our living, breathing lives, but as we go day by day, that we humbly lay ourselves down in service to others and in service to God. Instead of holding on so tightly to our lives that we actually lose it altogether. And Jesus said himself in John 15, greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for one's friends. And this, friends, is a beginning of a week that would put his lowly position and sacrifice on full display. There were moment after moment, as the week goes along, we see Jesus consistently humble, laying himself down. And I want to remind you of the words of Philippians 2 when Paul writes, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I know I quote that scripture quite often, but this, friends, is the incarnation it's, it's God, almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who spoke this world into being, he, the one who spoke you into being, and yet here he is riding on a lowly donkey, and this would set in motion a week of laying himself down. In fact, right before he went to Jerusalem, what does he do? And we talked about this maybe a month and a half ago. He washes his disciples' feet. Shouldn't they have been washing his feet? Yes. And yet he models for them, and in doing so, models for us the way of the gospel. I was talking, with, as I often do, about my sermon with my family. And last night, Be Becky and the, and the women's group, I know some of the other ladies are leading some of the, some of the, the, the teaching. Uh, and, you're going, and you're using N.T. NT Wright's commentary on, uh, on, on the book of Matthew. And so she, she broke it out. And she's like, well, let's see what he says here in Matthew. And this is a paraphrase. I don't have it word for word. But, ba but basically, Wright says, Jesus in this moment fulfilled all of the people of Israel's hopes and dreams and and disappointed them all at the same time, right? 
because we want a mighty warrior. And make no mistake, Jesus is a mighty warrior. But he models for us the way of the gospel. The paradox of the gospel is to gain your life, you must lay it down. To be rich, you need to be poor. Well, Jesus had sent his disciples ahead to secure the cult. Others of his followers had started the shouts of praise And with the city full because of the festival of Passover and word spreading about Jesus' raising of Lazarus from the dead just the day before, a contagious shout of praise erupted. Now, I don't know about you, and I know I've said this before, probably on previous Prom Sundays, but, but this has always captured my imagination. I remember even as a young child, it just, it moved me. As a kid, I was completely taken with this spontaneous worship service, this this scene as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem for the last time before his death. And in many ways, what we see in this moment and and what we seek to do here on Sunday morning is, is to recreate when we gather to worship that scene. Where, where we just, we are, we're just overcome with the presence of the king that we are drawn to worship. We're moved to worship God. And so now I'm going to use that conglomerated uh, thing. These are all of the things that the crowd says. Hosanna, which means save us or save us now. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Blessed is the king of Israel. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. See, Jesus here is not telling them to be quiet. Remember what, like I said before, when he heals somebody all throughout those first three years of his ministry, he says, now don't tell anybody. Of course, they don't listen to him. And there's all sorts of, hey, Jesus did this, right? I I think of the the Gadarene demoniac where a a legion of demons is cast out of this guy. And that's the one case, that's the one situation where Jesus says, go and tell. And the whole region is transformed and comes to Christ because of that. Experiences freedom because of the freedom that Jesus gives. Jesus is not telling them to be quiet here. He's not saying, don't speak of this. No, he's taking the place as the king. And when the Pharisees complain and tell Jesus to quiet his disciples from praising praising him, he says, if they stop, the stones will cry out in praise. Listen, friends, I think if we stop praising him, I wouldn't be surprised if the cinder blocks that hold up this building and the bricks that make up this building start crying out in praise to the king. The king deserves to be praised and his creation knows it. And so Jesus says, hey, if they stop praising me, the rocks will cry out. You see, here's, here's really the center, central kind of idea today is I believe that some, there's something deep inside us that resonates with giving the king the honor that he deserves. And friends, I need you to know today that at the deepest part of our soul, there's a desire to give our highest praise to King Jesus. At the deepest parts of our soul, there's a powerful inherent desire to give our highest uh, devotion and praise to King Jesus. It's at the very core of who we are. It's the center of our soul. And this goes all the way back, I believe, to the beginning of creation. Right there on the first few pages of the scripture, we see God as the ultimate ruler, as the ultimate king. And he still holds that title, by the way. And his creation, including Adam and Eve, are honoring him. They're basking in the majesty and grandeur of his presence in his creation. Yet when Adam and Eve chose to take the reins of their own lives and be their own rulers, the bond was severed. But friends, you need to know what? The longing for that connection never really faded away. 
for you and me this morning, the longing to worship the king is still there. And not just for us in this room or for those of you who are tuning in on the live stream, but for every soul that walks the face of the earth. Every human being has a deep longing to connect and worship the king. Amen. And all throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Hebrew Bible, there's anticipation of the coming of a Messiah, of a Savior. The the Scripture prophesies of one who would come to restore all things, one who would come to make all things new, to put everything right. And again, this promise starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, where a prophecy speaks of a child from the woman's seed who will crush the head of the serpent. And although Jesus, the promised one, would endure great suffering, and we're going to look more detail on that on Friday, he ultimately triumphs over evil. And unlike Superman, there is no kryptonite that will defeat him, not even the grave. Oh, I'm getting my head of myself now. That's next Sunday, right? That's Resurrection Sunday. We're going to talk about Jesus overcoming sin and death and the grave. There is no kryptonite for Jesus He is more than Superman. That's the title of my message, by the way, more than Superman. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (sighs) Thank you, Lord. And this is a theme that is a central thread throughout the entire Bible. All pointing to one figure, King Jesus. It is all about him. He is the object of our affection. He is the one that our souls long to worship. And friends, this is is a promise that embodies the hope of all humanity. And regardless of whether people recognize it or not, this longing is ingrained in every single one of us on this earth. And humanity all throughout history has been striving essentially since the dawn of time to return back to Eden, to return back to that place where God is worshipped in fullness in all of his splendor. To a life where we were meant to serve the king And not just any king, but the king of kings, by whose name every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And those under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But how many of you know that we often settle for counterfeit kings? Every one of us. I know I do it. How about you? We follow after and worship our favorite pop star. And I'm not, no shade against you Swifties, no shade. shade. I'm a Swiftie. Or our favorite band. And as I mentioned already, some of us love to be all wrapped up in the British royals and and keep tabs on every and any drama that takes place. And just as a side note, I actually feel bad for Kate Middleton. I mean, the Photoshop thing was a little weird, but, but doesn't she have the right to, like the rest of us, to, to, to keep her health challenges to herself if she chooses so? And we're all up in her business. We worship our favorite podcaster or our favorite movie star. How about this? I know I'm going to uh, uh, ruffle little feathers this morning. We worship our favorite politician and crown them as king. And don't think I'm not calling out both sides of the aisle because I am an equal opportunity offender when it comes to political idolatry because it has no place in the church and in your faith, period. Jesus is the king. It's not King Trump. It's not King Obama. It's not King Biden. It's Jesus. And I'm going to try not to wag my finger, but just remember, we are in an an election year. And so I'm, I'm speaking to every one of us for a moment here. Keep the mind of Christ, keep the spirit of Christ in your debate with others, in your conversations with others. Don't put anybody else on the throne but Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, capital K. Amen. 
Some of us even make our favorite pastor or church leader king, and I know probably none of you do that for me, but <laughs> don't, don't ever. Years ago, I came across this quote by C.S. Lewis about this very issue, and I, I just think it's fantastic. He said, where men are forbidden to honor a king, they honor millionaires, athletes, or film stars instead, even famous prostitutes or gangsters, gangsters for spiritual nature, now catch this, for spiritual na nature, like bodily nature, will be served. Deny it food, and it will gobble poison. Do you catch what Lewis is saying here? He say, imagine you're starving in the desert. We've spent the past five weeks in the desert. Imagine you're starving in the desert and you come to some vegetation where you notice some berries, maybe some red berries. I, I remember stumbling upon some of these things in the Adirondacks when I was younger. And there comes a moment where you're so hungry that even though in your mind you might know that these are poisonous, your body is so hungry that you eat those berries even though you know they're harmful because your body is craving for food and that craving for that food outweighs your mind's warning signs and you eat them anyway and Lewis is saying that just like your body craves food to the point where you would consume poison he suggests that this concept mirrors in our spiritual lives that as I've already driven home already today in our innate desire to follow a king or a leader, that desire is so powerful that we'll even follow harmful leaders just to fulfill that need. So just like the body, our spirit yearns for the king, and sometimes if we don't know where to put that worship, we will swallow poison. And many times we do this even though we're fully aware of what or who we're dedicating ourselves to, that they might be detrimental or even deadly, and yet we follow and bend the knee, as it were, to this counterfeit king. But friends, I want to tell you and remind you that the moment that we are at our best is when we're serving something and more, more, more specifically someone who is higher and loftier, uh, loftier than us. It is a part of our DNA. It's a part of how God made us. It is the very image of God on our souls. And as we were created in his image, we are created to give back to him worship and honor. The only way that we can be fully satisfied is that we serve the one true king. So many problems, friends, arise in our lives because of the things that we have crowned king. The things that we have made sovereign in our lives that are actually oppressing us. If you're living for your job, your job will oppress you and become your unsatisfied master. If you're living for your wealth, if you haven't realized it already, you will be disappointed. If you're putting all your energy, as I've already mentioned, into your political can candidate, they will disappoint you as well. The examples are endless. You see, there's only room for one king. And he unlike all of these other counterfeits, will not oppress you because he's meek and lowly. And friends, I want to tell you that salvation comes in ways that we least expect it. Salvation came that day, that first Palm Sunday, in the way that none of the people expected it. So as we close today, I want to ask you, regardless of who you are, Regardless of how old you are or where you come from or how much money you have, even regardless of whether or not you have chosen to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, regardless of any of those things, who is sitting on the throne of your life? Right now, who's on the throne of your life? Is it Jesus? Now, for those of you who have committed your life to follow Jesus, have you pushed him to the side for something or someone else? 
If so, it's time to confess and invite Jesus back onto the throne of your life. But if you've never trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord, I wonder if today is the day that you embrace his invitation to be king in your life. I wonder if today is the day that you say yes to Jesus. And if that is you today, please let Brian or Becky or myself know we want to pray for you as you begin the journey with Jesus. Now, I'm out of time. I had so much more I wanted to say today, but I want to leave you with this thought. And this is one of the other thoughts that came to me as I prepared for this Palm Sunday 2024. I think that Palm Sunday is the beginning of a week-long coronation. Back to this idea of a coronation. It's kind of like in some cultures, I know in, in Indian culture, a wedding isn't just a one-day affair, right, Nancy? It's, it's like two or three days, four days. This is like a, this is like a long thing. It's like you, you celebrate the wedding, and then you come back tomorrow and do the same thing again. And I think that this coronation was a week-long event. And here's what you see generally at a coronation. Like I said, I didn't watch Charles's coronation, but you see an anointing of oil. You see music and processions, distinguished guests crowning. You see regalia and symbols. And I want to unpack each one of these in this week of coronation for Jesus. In John 12, 3, Mary, Jesus' friend, the sister of Lazarus, anoints his feet with expensive perfume, oil, and wipes them with her hair. And Jesus said, basically, she's anointing me for, for death. Now, I don't know about music and processions, but but we just saw this procession for Palm Sunday. So certainly there was a celebration. How about distinguished guests in Jesus' last week before the cross? I mean, other than maybe Caesar himself, what important person in Jerusalem was not there as they sent Jesus to the cross? At a coronation, you see a crowning. The centerpiece of the coronation is the crowning of the monarch. They're given a crown to symbolize their authority, and it's a big moment with lots of pomp, right? Jesus was crowned, wasn't he? Except he wasn't crowned with a, a fancy gold crown adorned with jewels. No, it was a crown of thorns. And as for the symbols the soldiers that beat and mocked Jesus put, him, put on him a purple robe, purple being the, the sign or the color of royalty. Don't miss the significance of that symbolically. Next Sunday, we are going to adorn that cross with purple as we celebrate the resurrection of the king. And finally, one more thing that we see at coronations, and I'm sure there's much more, at a coronation, there's usually a speech that's given by the new monarch. Jesus on the cross said seven different statements as he hung there, but the last two, I think, are some of the most significant. He said, it is finished. It is finished. The penalty has been paid. The sacrifice has been given so that you and me can enter into salvation because of his sacrifice. And lastly, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, willingly giving up his life to save yours and mine. That's King Jesus. Is he on the throne of your soul? And if you're struggling this morning, keeping him on the throne come forward. We want to pray for you. There's no shame in that. Jesus says, come as you are, and I will change you. I will give you life. I will make your path straight.